Kate Blood and I'm your webinar chair today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners of all the land wherever we're joining the webinar today. For me, participating from Beaufort in Western Victoria, Australia, this is the land of the Wathaurong people. I'd like to extend my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and any other elders who may be joining us today. We recognise that there are many traditional owners caring for country, including weed and fire management activities, and some of these practices play a key role in continuing their culture. I'd like to welcome you today on behalf of myself, Kate Blood, and my colleague Bianca Gold, who's based at Horsham, uh, and our many collaborators. Bianca and I are the Weeds at the Early Stage of Invasion team, which is part of the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning here in Victoria. We're hosting today through the statewide integrated flora and fauna teams, also known as SWIFT, through their website. And we want to thank SWIFT for supporting this webinar series. We're also proud members of the Weed Society of Victoria, another one of our many collaborators. Our tech support today is from Matt Bliss from Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Thanks, Matt. And we'd like to acknowledge the many collaborators that you'll see in the logos on the various slides and promotional material uh, today. Uh, now, for those of you who have not logged into the previous webinar uh, last week, uh, we just wanted to mention that uh, there are many hours of work to run a series like this and that with the help of many people. So we'd particularly like to thank Andrew Geschke from DELP's Connecting Communities program for great support and uh, also the many images and connecting slides that you'll see throughout the webinar. Uh, we wanted to thank our many regional staff of DELP, particularly the Natural Environment Program and the Forest, Fire and Regions Group. Mal Corrie from DELP's Weeds and Pests on Public Land Program uh, has been a big supporter of our project. And we'd like to also welcome and thank Parks Victoria colleagues and our supervisor, Stefan Kaiser, who is joining us today. The webinars cover a number of different aspects of weed management after fire, and uh, it's relevant for planned burns and also for wildfires. Uh, so just uh, letting you know that even though we might not mention planned burns, a lot of this information is also relevant for those circumstances. So across the series so far of these four webinars, we've had over 1,400 registrations from all over the world. So we welcome people from wherever you are in Australia or uh, overseas. Um, if you're using social media today, uh, we're using a hashtag weed fire webinars so it uh, it'd be great if you wanted to tag us in any posts that you might be making and uh, follow some of our social media feeds if you've got any questions or comments during the webinar please put them in the chat which is over to the side of uh, of the screen if you're following us through the the live youtube uh, feed. You can uh, email us questions. There'll be a, an email address posted periodically on your screen and you can use that email address to, to ask questions or make comments. Um, all of the comments, links and so on from the chat will also be uh, put onto the SWIFT website along with the recording of this webinar uh, in the days afterwards. So if you miss out, uh, you can always come back and find them later. Um, we have four presentations today and will be finished by 12.15. Um, and most importantly, these webinars have been made possible through funding from the Victorian government's $22.5 million Bushfire Biodiversity Response and Recovery Program. So the abbreviation is BBRR. So that's probably an abbreviation you'll hear quite a bit today. So that's the Bushfire Biodiversity Response and Recovery Program. Uh, so uh, my colleague Bianca Gold is posting many links and so on during the webinar in the chat uh, and we'll also be relaying questions at the end of each presentation. 
So I'd like to get started with our first webinar speaker today and uh, invite Steve Taylor from ACT's Parks Invasive Plants Program. So Steve's based in Canberra in the Australian Capital Territory and uh, I've been watching with great interest Steve's work over the last few years in particular and uh, watching him develop some really interesting processes and adoption of technology. So it's really great to have Steve here today to share his, uh, his material and, uh, and all his work that's going on and uh, he's very active on social media and so on as well. So I'd like to introduce Steve to you. Steve is talking about prioritising invasive plant control after very high severity wildfire. So over to you, Steve. Right, hello everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity and um, Thank you, Kate, for that nice introduction. I'll just share my screen with everyone so I can get started with my talk. And you'll see that at the, my talk really centres on our mapping system and how that's allowed us to develop a really good system for prioritising post-fire basic plant control. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Um, send me a message if you can't. <laughs> or Bianca or Kate jump in and tell me if you can't see the screen. It's good, Steve, we can see it, thank you. Okay, so I'll jump straight to the, this is our, the way we present a lot of our information. This is a ESRI story map, and it's got our invasive plants operations plan, but I'll jump straight to the section of today's talk. So we, we, we looked at our um, post-fire response, and we decided to base it a lot on um, the, I think it was the 2012 Parks Victoria Zimmer report on post-fire weeds triage, but we extended it further because we realised with our mapping system, we could, first of all, not only identify post-fire um, increases species, that's invasive plants that can really take advantage and um, spread invasively after fire, and use that sort of information that's in the Park Victoria report combined with our mapping of where we know those species are in the Magi National Park, which has been affected by fire. And we know where there's higher levels of disturbance because that's often the first way these species get into these areas. So the way we did that is, I'll jump straight to the post-fire operations dashboard, and this is how we do it. So we've got a list of the species that are post fire increases. So we'll focus on one of them, African lump grass. And what we can do is we can go through a particular area and filter on African lump grass and just see what level of problem we have, and potential problem we have in this area with African lump grass. And I just filter on all these levels. And then make sure we don't need we don't need the blackberry layer, so we can remove that from our mapping. Focus on the love grass for now. So the way we do it, so African love grass is a post-fire increasing species, and that's you know identified through using that Parks Victoria methodology. And in this map here, this is part of fire affecting the Magic National Park. The red areas is where the fire was most intense. The fire went through these areas. So that's where the highest level of disturbance is. The yellow and black polygons are known infestations of African love grass dating back over a number of years. Some were um, active infestations managed before the fire, others um, were dormant with seed, seed bank, clearly there because the seed bank lasts a little while. So these areas we can prioritise for our post fire inspection to have a quick response to any germination of African lump grass. And these are areas we identify as sort of high risk because they're close to areas with high levels of disturbance, which 
a lot of us will take advantage of and to move into those areas. And so we apply this um, operations dashboard approach across the whole of the Meti National Park and staff that are a bit more you know, familiar with GIS systems can create heat maps themselves so they don't have to manually look through each area to see which area they expect. They can create heat maps to focus their attention on inspections and quick responses. Excuse me, Steve, it's yes. Kate. Would you please uh, speak more loudly or uh, oh. closer to your microphone? We're just having okay. some trouble hearing you. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes, I can. Great, okay. So, I'll move on to the next slide now, and hopefully there'll be no problems for being able to hear me. Um, so being able to do that sort of system where we look at the intersects of high levels of disturbance, close fire and increased species, and then focus our attention on those sites for inspection, um, it all revolves around our mapping system. And the, we're lucky in the ACT because we're really just one big region within New South Wales, and there's one land management agency that manages most of the ACT, like we manage, I think, 75% of the ACT. So it's easy to get everyone on the same mapping system, which is crucial to have this sort of approach. And what we've done is we've used the Arctis Collector app over a number of years, and that can be used offline in remote areas or online in the urban areas. And that data goes up to Arctis online, which then feeds through to the operations dashboards, like that one you saw for the post-fire response. And it looks like this. And what this allows us to do more generally is look at intersects of um, a post-fire increase of species using that post-fire weed triage approach. So we pick out the love grass, we've built it on African love grass for the whole of the ACT here. And then we can, um, we had a look at that example in the Magi National Park, which was burnt, but we had a number of other fires recently. So we can go into another area of the ACT, have a look at what issues we can predict in that area. And we had some fires in urban areas with remnant woodland in the ACT during last summer as well. And what we can do is we can just zoom out into an area and this is the area that was burnt. And we can see where the African lovegrass infestations are. And those are the priority areas for in inspection. And as, it, as it's turned out, um, we've been doing control work there already. This, this is actually a live dashboard. So these are the African lovegrass sites that we've been doing African lovegrass control post fire. Um, and so we have a very good accurate mapping and we can do some quite um, interesting analysis to see how well we're going with control in those areas. One, one thing we do do is we have a system where we look at um, applying some research based on critical threshold analysis. And that's some research that came out of New Zealand where they looked at density of invasive plants. And, they categorised their density using the DAF4 system, dominant, abundant, frequent, occasional, rare. And that was a good coincidence for us because that's how we um, record our density of weeds when we're mapping. So we were able to apply the research and the critical threshold seems to be at that frequent level where you get a quite a significant drop in local species richness of native plants. So we created a little gauge you can see there at the top of the screen called the critical threshold gauge and it gives you an idea of the number of sites where 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 the density is below that threshold and then we go to the traffic light system that's a nice visual system so in this particular area we're below the critical threshold on most sites but if you zoom into any particular site um, the gauge can of course change um, it may change Zoom in here, and you can see the gauge changing with the higher density. So that's that's the type of analysis we can do to help us with our post-fire response to see what sort of problem we're having with um, 
invasive plants interfering with um, regeneration of native and other desirable plants. And we can also, we've also applied the same approach to new incursion species that are post-fire increases. Um, we know from research in New South Wales in Kosciuszko National Park, research done by Dr. Keith McDougall and one of the rangers there, Eloise, um, they looked at oxide daisy in the post-fire increase um, response to oxide daisy. In the, in the Manji National Park, which has been affected by fire, we've got um, an issue with the closely related Shasta daisy, which is a um, some or some botanists regard it just as a, a variety of um, oxide daisy, but it also has a post fire increasing response. And we can also look at um, use this, this mapping information to zoom in on that. So I'll just show you that. We go to the area, the area that was burnt. So all this area was burnt in the fire, and we can filter on Shasta Baby. And that's that green polygon you're seeing there. And that's actual control work. So that's increased in spread after the fire. Um, and if we, we've all, this is a weed in the early stage of invasion for us. So we have a different gauge to look at here. We have this, um, what we call our extirpation gauge. Extirpation means local eradication, as opposed to true definition of eradication, meaning that you'd be trying to eradicate Chester Baby from the whole of the southeast of um, New South Wales, but that's not possible. But we are trying to locally eradicate it from the Magic National Park, so our, our objective is extirpation. Here, this gauge we're using, based on, again, some other research that's come out of New Zealand, um, the density of the site is such and that the, the maturity of the plants is such that we're a bit concerned we can't locally eradicate it because we we think C has dispersed from the site and we haven't located those like um, those spots yet. So that's the type of information we can use for our post-fire response. And how do we measure success with our work? Well, we can see through this, this is threat abatement success because we're actually controlling something. But we also look at um, did we succeed in restoring the site? And our ecologists have um, some detailed plots on the density of different invasive plant species. Some of these correspond to areas that were burnt where we're doing active management of weeds. But we also do the standard level, the basic level of monitoring is we get the ranges to do photo points. And I'll just show you one of these in a post-fire area to give you an idea of how difficult these can be for us. Um, so this is an area of um, River Tussock, Poa Lavaladieri, that was affected by a very severe fire. Um, this wasn't in the last fires, this was a couple of years ago. Um, and Unfortunately, it actually killed 30% of the poas in this area because it was so hot. We had a nodding thistle invasion, you can see from this image. And good news is we got onto it pretty early. Um, with the, de the density of the nodding thistle was so great that we were able to helicopter spray without actually affecting any native colonisers that were trying to survive under the nodding thistle. And we um, with a bit of luck in returning rainfall, we, the, after two or three years' work, we got a really good result, as you can see there. Um, so that's a case of photos showing the story. That's all a couple of different poa species, um, a whole lot of native colonisers in there, and, and we've, we've definitely switched the ecosystem back in the right direction. Um, we put some leaky weirs in as well, and some grazing exclusion as well. So, that gives you an idea of, I guess, how we're using our mapping system and previous work by the Victorian government, Park Victoria, focusing on the post-fire increased species. And then we've luckily got the mapping system where we, we know where those are and we can prioritise that work. And then we've tried to bring some of the science into it on when, it's, when we think it's feasible to locally 
eradicate something or extirpate something and also um, what level of threat there is based on that critical threshold density of invasive plants. So I think I've come in under time, which is good. Um, so I'm actually probably set it up actually because I think hopefully there'll be a few questions. Thanks, Steve. What a, a great tool and a great um, way of capturing your data as well as, um, yeah, a place for people to access the invasive plants information in your area. Uh, we have a couple of questions. So, um, Teen, who's actually one of our presenters later, is asking, is the advantage of treating African love grass or Shasta daisy post fire merely to prevent increased post fire or is there an advantage for control if treating post fire? Why would the control be prioritised in higher density areas rather than lower density areas where we would expect more alternative species? So there's two parts to that question. I'm happy to repeat the second part if you didn't quite catch all that. Um, okay. Um, well, the, the second part, I guess I can address that straight away. Um, well, we actually do, I'll just jump to this, um, we do actually sort of secure the best areas first um, and we can do that with our mapping um, where we're dealing with um, single, you know, outlier infestations of origin species like African love grass um, and the mapping helps us with that too because with the mapping, i to go back to mapping slide. What you're seeing there is, you know, some major infestations, but you'll see in that screenshot from the iPad, the level of detail we get down to with mapping. So you can see, um, in this case, we're looking at nodding thistle. You can see some major infestations there in the outlier infestations. So we can, so we get really good um, uptake from both the rangers and the contractors. They'll map any of our high risk post fire species, we've basically told them map it all. And even if you've just chipped out an African love grass plant in the native grassland, it's recovering only one plant, we want it mapped because we want to know what's going on in that. So that's the second part of the question. What was the first part again? That was... Um, yep, so that first pass part was about, is the advantage of treating African love grass or Shasta daisy Post fire merely to prevent increase post fire, or is there their advantage for control if treating post fire? Well, I guess it's multifaceted. Um, we're we're doing that um, because because we know you know in these um, a lot of these native ecosystems are fire adapted and the, and if we don't let those sorts of species that can interfere with spontaneous succession after a fire um if we if they don't have them there the native ground cover will restore itself so but we know these post fire increases species they'll quite happily move into those um, disturbed areas and interrupt the plant succession and they're not they're not um part of the plant succession they're actually an invasive plant so that's they'd actually be, um, they actually stop the whole process of succession. So there's that immediate effect, that effect there. And then, then there's the containment effect as well, um, because we're stopping it spreading further in the landscape. Um, so in this screenshot, just from an iPad using a collector, you can see some big non existing infestations, which are the red hashes, but there's some black little black dots there. That's um, African love grass control post fire. And there's an immediate benefit of those sites if we can control it before it gets to a density that causes native plants species richness to drop out. But also, we're going to contain it because we're going to stop it spreading in that pile of grass. Land. So, I think hopefully that answers the question if I've interpreted it correctly. Thank you. Um, there's another one. How much follow up was required for the nodding thistle? And were there more than one application for, from helicopter? Oh yes. oh, yes. So, for the nodding thistle um, example, um, the initial spraying um, was helicopter heli spraying, and the infestation was about 
30 to 40 hectares and it was you know abundant yeah, across the density across that in some spots it's, you'd say it was well up to being you know over 90 percent cover um then there was we got a very good result from that even though it was spraying late um we managed to stop further seeding of the nodding thistle and even some of the flowering nodding thistle stopped um seeding and then we did three lots of a lot of controlled spot spraying with ground fruit, and then we were very lucky with the um, we were able to employ um, Liz McPhee from Alpine Flora, who does work in New South Wales and Kosciuszko National Park. She used to work in New South Wales National Parks, and she helped us with some restoration techniques to try and re wet the area because at that point we still had um, the drought impacting, so that we put in leaky weirs, which helped. A lot of um, parrots, colonised in species come in and it got wetter in some areas to the point which it discouraged nodding thistle. Then we were lucky we had the um, break in the drought with the rain and because we've got on top of the nodding thistle, um, with the germination that resulted, the native plants that started dominating again. So, so one primary control, three follow up controls, and the herbicide used was clopyrolid. Um, trade name Lontral, and it was at label rent. Good. Um, do you know what the relative cost of mapping this data is compared with the budget for the work needed on ground to deal with the weed problems? And there's, are you able to draw on the considerable and timely extra resources needed post fire? So there's two parts to that question as well. Yeah. Um, we actually, we actually have worked out the cost, but I can't remember the figures. But look, it is um, significant, but the benefits um, outweigh that because we can actually, uh, you know, apply that adaptive management approach by actually seeing, you know, whether our intervention is actually having the effect we want and whether we need to change our management. So that's very important. So yeah, if you really want to do adaptive management well, you got to have some pretty good mapping to go with it. Um, particularly these days with ranges shifting different areas all the time, um, having that mapping system in place is just so much more efficient when a new ranger comes in, they can just see where things are at and what's being done. Um, and we try to be a bit um, efficient too about the way we do things. So for example, when we've got a contract that we've planned an area where we've brought contractors in, in to help the rangers and say they're doing um, the broom um, control sites. So we've got some large areas where we've got English broom control, but it's under control. Um, we've had it under control for some time, but we do we, um, yearly monitoring. We're doing more monitoring now for post fire because it's a post fire increase. Um, what we do is we tell them, oh, look, we want these other species if you spot them mapped at the same time. So, uh, so the contractor will be in there doing the actual broom control, but we've said if there's any of these other particular species, then we'll give them you know, um, a bunch of species that we're concerned about in that area, and they'll um, map it on the collect wrap too, and that's, and that's easy enough to be doing that as they go. So we find that's an efficient way of combining the mapping with the control, particularly um, to helping us with making further plans for management in an area. I that answers it. Cool. Um, and I'm interested to know more about um, iNaturalist and your use of iNaturalist and how valuable you think iNaturalist is um, okay. in invasive plant management and identification, I guess. Okay. Well, this sort of citizen science stuff. So we in Canberra, we're lucky. We've got two systems. We've got Canberra Nature Map, which Dr. Michael Mulvaney set up. And he set it up just about the time when iNaturalist was taking off in Australia. And for those that haven't used iNaturalist, um, it's now being picked up by the Atlas of Living Australia as their preferred um, field data app for recording um, plants and animals. And the data from iNaturalist goes to the Atlas. If it's verified data, it'll end up in that global biodiversity information facility that picks up the data from the nation's atlases around the world. Um, 
the app's very useful because it also has that uh, computer recognition tool in it, which if you get a photo, a good photo of a flower or a distinctive part of a plant, it actually will get the, um, the genus pretty accurately. Um, and that's even with native plants now too, that improve the um, database that it uses, and it's uses some other fancy um, methods of trying to pick what the genus is. So that's quite helpful. And then, and there's more um, volunteer in the botanical field, more volunteer botanists who monitor posts of various taxa and can jump in and help correct people and ID plants. And the benefit for in if you're in a weeds and pest team is that you can ask it to give you automatic alerts for species that you're really concerned about. So for high risk early invaders, you can we've got a bunch of those here, like every other jurisdiction. We get alerts if someone posts something on iNaturalist or Canberra Nature Map um, that they think is that species, and then we can immediately see it. It popped up on our email, and we can either confirm the ID or correct the ID or if we're uncertain ourselves, go and do an inspection and get it, um, the herbarium to ID the plant. So that's that's a very useful system. And then we discovered that the problem we were having with photo monitoring points, as I mentioned before, with rangers shifting depots all the time, they'd put their photos in different locations or just keep them on their phone and we would we'd lose track of photo points over time. So we decided we'd use um, the cloud system that iNaturalist has got for the photo monitoring points, um, and that way we can keep track of those. And we also, in the collector um, fields we have, we have a free field for just comments. So I have all pick lists when they're mapping a polygon, but we have a free field for comments. And we soon realised we can easily just, you can have the uh, iNaturalist app open and just paste the link straight into the comments field on the mapping so you can link the photo point to the polygon collector. And that's been very useful too. And that'll be useful over time because some of our photo monitoring points, you know, we want them to last, you know, 20 plus years. So, and in fact, we've got, uh, we've uploaded some old photos such as this example here into our naturalist. So this is, 15 years ago, and this was a grassland that was given to us to manage. It was an abandoned grazing area, and it was dominated by a serrated tussock, as you can see. And luckily, 15 years ago, when I was working as a ranger, I took a photo of the work. I don't know what camera it would have been. Anyway, luckily, I still had the image, so I put it up on iNaturalist, and then um, I also had the location through GPS, so I was able to revisit the site. And these are images, recent images of the same site. So that's 15 years later, the same site. That's now a native grass and dominated by tall spear grass and uh, red grass, and quite a good few number of common wildflower species like yellow buttons, wild and persia, um, Vitidinia. And then with this extraordinary spring we've had, this is the same site with the tall spear grass in flower. And just feel that no tall speed grass you can get tall. I had to stand on a rock to get that photo because it was as high as me, tall as me. Um, so, so that's how we are using it. So we're sort of we're using it, um, I guess, in a multi-purpose way of alert education and then it's a place to store our photo points and then and then we're bound to link the iNaturalist and the collector apps together um, through that way I described before. Fantastic that's a really yeah, efficient way of doing things and making sure that that uh, information is being collected and stored in in one place for people to go back to. I think I've probably got time for one more question. Um, wondering about the software that you've used so that that you've got on the screen there, the oh. um, story maps or storyboard that you're using. Oh, yes. Can you tell us a bit more about that, please? Okay, so um, like, you know, most parks and environment agencies, um, we use Esri products like um, ArcGIS Pro, ArcMap for our mapping. 
Um, but if you've if you've got that sort of license with them, you can just pay a bit more and you can get an ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Online license. And as soon as you've got ArcGIS Online, that allows you to use the um, collector app um, and survey one two three app, and that then allows you to do that mapping we did, and then that in, and the collector app informs it syncs to ArcGIS Online, and then those dashboards at the start of the talk, the post fire weeds triage one, and that's an operations dashboard using all that data. But then they have all these other um, whiz bang sort of presentation systems that you get access to once you have that um, ArcGIS Online license. And this is one of them. I think we might have had a problem with connection there where Steve's screen has frozen and his microphone's dropped out, perhaps. All right, I think we might uh, we might move on. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. Uh, we acknowledge that there were some audio issues with that presentation, so uh, apologies for that. And uh, I guess that's just one of the, uh, the things that we have to deal with is the joy of uh, our good or not so good internet connections, uh, as many of us are working from home at the moment. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that uh, Steve Taylor has come to us today from the Environment Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate with the ACT Parks and Invasive Plants Program. So thanks very much, Steve. And Steve's very active on social men uh, media, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we can put some uh, links in the chat to uh, one of the feeds that he contributes to on a, a very active ACT in Southeast New South Wales invasive plants group on Facebook. Um, so uh, thanks again, Steve. So the just reinforcing today's theme is all about prioritization. Uh, so when you when you have an area that's been burnt by fire and you're deciding what your weed priorities are, just where do you start in working out which weeds do you deal with first? So uh, Steve's got a very well developed data system uh, and uh, some very snaffy um, uh, spatial systems and so on to help him him do that work. So each presenter today is using a, a different method to work out prioritization, but basically following a similar process. So I'd uh, I'd like to welcome our next speaker now, uh, which is Mitch Williams from the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Mitch is based down in the very southwest corner of Victoria uh, and has been working on the Glenelg Eden for some time. And it's been great working with Mitch through our Weeds at the Early Stage of Invasion project. Uh, and we're really keen to hear from Mitch today, today about how he's been tinkering with some of the tools that we use to uh, adapt and help him prioritise the weeds in his area. So Mitch today is talking about prioritising weeds in the Glenelg Eden using the feasibility of eradication tool. So over to you, Mitch. Good morning and thank you very much, Kate and Bianca, for having me. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Thanks. Uh, today, we are going to have a little discussion about how my landscape scale project here in far southwest Victoria implemented WESI protocols to uh, make improvements in how we prioritise uh, weed rankings and our operational targets throughout this project. So we have our contents of what I'm going to roughly touch upon today, but I would like to acknowledge that the project does operate on Goodditchmara country down here in the far southwest of the state. Also, additionally, our project is funded through the Weeds and Pests on Public Land Initiative as part of DELP or WPPLI. Glenelg Eden is a long running landscape scale project that's looking to target weed species across our landscape on a triage based system. Operationally, we manage about $70,000 uh, per year from WPPL of a total budget of about $170,000. We aim to reduce weed cover by protecting environmental assets, reducing the weed cover and eradicating species where possible. 
We started small, but we eventually worked our way up to treating about 170 targets uh, across the landscape, which could be broadly categorised as 110 different infestations. And every year, uh, we uh, manage to find new things that we can categorise and add into those targeting processes. The project aims to uh, put most of its resources towards targeting new and emerging infestations to have better value outcomes. This is a map of our project area. It's a reasonably large landscape. Um, it's in the far southwest of Victoria and it exclusively operates with one exception, which is the top end of Rennick State Forest between the Princess Highway and the coastline. Uh, the public land estate across this area is heavily fragmented. And as a result, compared to our two sister Edens, Otways Eden and Central Highlands Eden, we have an additional administrative layer of management zones that we uh, base our targets from. We work on both Parks Victoria and Delp Land. So effectively that's uh, national parks, reserves and state forest. And all up, we approximately work on about 80,000 hectares of land in the, uh, in the landscape. Originally, the program started in about, well, the project started in 2008. And its initial process was to go and do wide ranging surveys or minute surveys across the whole landscape in one kilometre grid squares effectively to determine what was out there and what was possibly a threat. Um, it didn't necessarily determine uh, bulk cover, but it determined where we could find particular invasive species and it did effectively account and arrange. This was later bolstered by a range of inputs through workshops with uh, various land managers around the, around the uh, landscape and we got far more significant invasive species data out of that in order to start developing uh, much more much more intensive works plans for treating weed species. Unfortunately, um, it didn't translate magnificently into a works program uh, because ultimately we had an idea of where we had weed species, what weed species and how much cover they did, but we didn't necessarily have a mechanism in, in which to rank where, how we would actually prioritise our works. And what we found in amongst that is that uh, you do get competing interests amongst the landscape. Um, apart from weeds advisory listings, the only other metric we had for prioritisation was how we felt about an infestation and how we felt we might have success with trying to target it for eradication. This often resulted in uh, operations that were crew heavy and predominantly or putting more of their focus towards established species in the landscape, which didn't necessarily adhere to the invasion curve. So if we have a look at the invasion curve model, effectively what we found is that although we had a range of species in the landscape and we had an idea of how much cover they had, we didn't necessarily have a strong metric for placing them or categorising them into the invasion curve in order to actually make a priority to target those works. At the end of the day, the best thing we could have said was it was a gut feeling. And when you're dealing with uh, such a large amount of investment, sometimes that just does not cut the mustard. So we made some changes. And effectively, how do we do our works planning now? We're capturing a lot of data for our outputs. We record our spatial information centrally. Um, we now do a lot of assessments of our, we do assessments of all our infestations using the WESI systems. And then that allows us to develop a prioritization of our works program and then deploy that works program. So effectively, the difference between what we do now operationally or within the project and what we did previously is our two areas over here on the right hand side of the cycle performing feasibility assessments and prioritization infestations we now have a much stronger mechanism in which to do that so um, probably about 2016 2016 2015 we had beck james who was at the time working with the wesi project come down and visit the landscape of glenelg eden 
we did a bit of a tour and we had a sit down and tried to work out how, as part of a requirement from the WPPL investors, we could implement the uh, weeds of early stage of invasion protocols into our project to make our project far more robust. After a range of talks, we worked out that we didn't necessarily need to include or adapt all six parts of the WESI protocols into our pre-existing large-scale project. We were doing a range of functions quite well on our own, but we did need to improve in some areas. So what support tools did we end up adopting? We ended up adopting predominantly book three, which is assessing the risk. This is what we used to further improve how we prioritise works. Because the Weeds of Early Stage of Invasion project um, predominantly deals with new and emerging species, we didn't necessarily know how well the tools that were provided in the guides would work if they were expanded out. So we went into this not necessarily having a strong idea of how robust these would be if we scaled them. But by goodness, we were going to find out. What we have here is a feasibility assessment sheet for Giant Reed in the Lower Glenelg National Park. This is one of the tools that's part of book three of the WESI guidelines. And what this does is it effectively allows you to go through a range of prompted questions about the infestation at hand and work out a score to then try and prioritise the species to determine whether or not it's uh, it's eradicable or maybe not, or maybe it is not eradicable. One of the key things to understand about the feasibility assessments is they're a little bit like golf. And what I mean by that is not necessarily trying to spend your best days out on the course. It's more about the lower the score you get at the end of the feasibility assessment for that infestation, the more likely it is that you're going to have good chance of eradicating that species. So if we look at high scores in the sheet, that's a bad thing. If we look at low scores, that's a good thing. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through this particular patch, or as our infestation code says, Glenelg 010, and we're going to talk about some of the key factors that influence that final score of 29. Uh, here we have a question in regards to whether or not the infestation occurs in situations that require treatment methods that are more expensive than standard methods. This particular patch of giant reed uh, needs to be cut and paste. And it needs to be cut and paste because of its locale. And I'll show you a photo of that in a moment. But because it was going to be slightly more difficult, it got a score of three rather than zero. That influenced its final score. Then site accessibility. You have three options for that, zero, three, and six, or high accessibility, medium, and low. This particular patch of giant reed uh, is in a very inaccessible area. And I'm going to bring up a photo and explain why. This is me assessing the actual infestation. As you can see, there is a giant limestone uh, cliff behind it. And what the photo doesn't show is I'm standing on the edge of said cliff and we're about to uh, be effectively in the Glenelg River. The only way to access this safely is by boat. And because of that, that's why we got a site accessibility score of six, which ultimately added nine to the score and would have bumped a score of 20 for the feasibility eradication mark up to 29. Let's move on. This one is for asparagus fern. And this particular assessment was for asparagus fern present in Mount Clay State Forest and Narrowong Flora Reserve, which is another one of our management areas. Now, <clears throat> if, if you're observant, you'll probably already notice that the final score is significantly higher. Now, we have to look at why that is. And effectively, in this particular instance, we have a range of things. Propagule dispersal is in mixed mode. So both humans animals, and animals can actually disperse this seed through mechanical disturbance or through e eating and spreading the seed as a vector, predominantly by birds. Because of the nature of that, this had to get the highest score in that particular category, which was six. Additionally to that, searching and detecting for this species in the vegetative matrix that is Mount Clay State Forest is significantly difficult because for the most part, unless the infestation is quite large, it hides well under the uh, ground fuels, such as your Brecon fern, 
and various other native grasses that are present in the area and it will continue to be undetectable until it pops out. So it makes it very hard to do a sweeping search for this particular species that's reasonably successful. Additionally to that, in amongst the actual vegetation matrix that we have in that area, uh, it is very hard to detect pretty much all year round. And because of that, it copped a very harsh score of 24 in its detectability period ranking. Ultimately, that's what gave us an additional mm -hmm, 30 or so, uh, 36 marks, which brought its score up to 53. 53, as you can probably imagine, is not a magnificent score, but what we'll do is we'll move on to another example of a species that we've had an assessment for. This one here is for myrtle leaf milkwort, otherwise known as polygala. And in this particular instance, this assessment was for the Kabobody National Park and Forest Park. This has an overall score of 14, which in the grand scheme of things is significantly low. And we need to have a look at why. Oh, sorry, I've gone one past. Effectively because our area cover is very small, hence getting a zero. Uh, the accessibility of the infestations that we know of and we had delimited was also very good, which gave it a zero. Uh, we found that it's very easy to search and detect for in amongst the vegetation matrix in that area. So that gave it a zero and it didn't have any particularly difficult uh, methods of um, methods of treatment, which gave it a zero. And because it was primar primarily a human mediated spread, particularly through mechanical disturbance along roadway edges and grading and whatnot, that also kept its score low. So we ended up getting a score of uh, 14 for that one. After assessing every single species and infestation that we had listed across the landscape, which is something that I think shocked the WESI team at the time that I said I was going to do that, we found that we could rank every infestation as per its eradicability and then prioritise those works in that. The first time we managed to get this done successfully was the 2016-17 financial year. Infestations with high odds of eradication are treated well ahead of those that are not. These priority rankings delivered uh, were delivered using primarily the outputs of the infestation feasibility assessments, as you saw in the slides before. We found that risk ratings out of the risk rating guide didn't necessarily influence much in the output of that number because of the homogeneity of, the, uh, of those scores in the risk rating. Now we are able to focus the bulk of our resources at trying to treat the weeds that are in earlier stages of their, of their invasion. And as a result, we're making better resource and decisions uh, in how we do those, uh, prioritise those works. Just as another note, uh, having released the original figures for this back in 2016-17 and uh, bringing uh, Kate, James and Bianca into, into the fold of how I stretched and skewed their, their, effective, their effective tool to fit across a whole range of infestations in the landscape, we also had uh, Sally and Brad as part of the Central Highlands team look to try and re-emulate the same. And one of the things we noticed is that regardless of the landscape, when you get output data at the end, it's reasonably familiar and it seems to be reasonably repeatable, which is a very, very strong sign that this tool is quite robust. Having ranked those scores, we get a graph that looks a little bit like this. What we find is that we had our broad goals for a range of the infestations that were effectively uh, input decisions made by a human, e.g. me. And then we had the range of those scores scattered across the landscape. And trying to do that in a blind way, we found that uh, we have a spread like this. So predominantly we found that uh, if a species had a score of about 25 or over, chances of it being eradicated using the feasibility uh, ranking tool were quite low. We found that uh, there was strong overlap between what we considered as being a containment objective or an asset protection objective. We really did push the WESI uh, feasibility assessment tool beyond what it was originally designed to do. And in doing so, we found that it actually stood up wonderfully. It behaved really well and it was a reasonably robust way of trying to prioritise our works.
we also found that some of their infestations are probably a bit far gone. <laughs> but that's how these things work when you get a score of somewhere between 65 and 75. So, what did we necessarily learn by implementing the assessment support tools? Here we have uh, our uh, invasion curve model. And before I click onto the next slide, I'm going to apologize for what I've done because I think it's probably a bit blasphemous, but we're gonna do it anyway. I found that by using our, uh, by using our <coughs> feasibility assessment tools, we worked out that uh, the Glenelg Eden results fit beautifully within the invasion curve model. It's almost uncanny and it actually is a really, it's a strong credit towards, uh, it's towards how the feasibility assessment tools by WESI have actually been made. It's a, and it's a very strong, robust argument towards the invasion curve. The fact that we can get one small project across a landscape to run these tools and effectively have outputs that fit within the model quite well shows that we're doing the right thing. Again, I'm not sure if it was particularly kosher of me to necessarily put numbers into the model, but I've done it anyway and I can't, I can't take it back now. Now, one of the major things about these presentations today is we're going to talk about how we deal with fire in the landscape and how it might affect weeds. Uh, I didn't necessarily have a particularly strong narrative for this when I came in to talk about prioritisation because in my landscape, although we had 14 fires start about December 2019, only one of those 14 fires actually impacted on a listed and targeted infestation site. In this particular instance, we found that a Watsonia a patch that we had in the Kabobini National Park also known as COP003 with its identity code, had got um, effectively caught up in the burn, in the fire that happened, and as and particularly as part of its suppression efforts. So it did receive both uh, fire impact and mechanical disturbance from trying to suppress that impact. And because of the location and the nature of the species, we found that it was very highly likely that we would receive significant amounts of spread if it was to re-establish, particularly through the road edge, particularly through disturbance, and particularly through waterborne vectors of spread such as drainage. The result that we had when things quietened down is that we went out and manually inspected the site to see what kind of impact we had. We found that we couldn't observe any of the target species and we weren't necessarily sure that was because of our year on year efforts to suppress the plant and eradicate it out of that area, or because of the mechanical disturbance making it hard to detect that plant. So what we decided to do is it kept its normal priority ranking number for this financial year, which is a range of sites across the Kabobini National Park and Forest Parks, but we will bump its, uh, we will manually elevate its priority in the next year's works planning and priority rankings manually, I must stress that, in order to go out and detect new plants and uh, effectively hit any existing bulbs that we had as soon as we can to try and capitalise on the interference that we had with the fire and the mechanical disturbance. If we'd had more infestation sites that were disturbed across the landscape, uh, landscape uh, during those fires, we probably would have changed uh, our um, effectively way of we dealing with it from doing a, a manual inspection to going out and using the post-fire weeds triage manual to make an assessment of how we may increase the priority of any species, uh, depending on primarily their biology in our future works. But luckily, because we only had one infestation impacted in the fires, that wasn't necessary for us. I'd like to thank everybody for having me here today. I would like to also thank the WESI project for being able to provide us with magnificent talks in order to uh, help not just new projects, community groups, volunteer groups, and, and small, small projects across, uh, across the landscape deal with infestations, but also us in dealing with larger invasive species projects across the landscape that are already established because we find that the tools work and they are great regardless of the scale of the project and how long it's been running. They can always be brought in and they can always make sense. 
So I'd like to thank you all today for having me on and I'm very happy to take any questions if there are any. Fantastic, Mitch. Thank you for that. And great to see the uh, WESI feasibility of eradication score sheet being used so thoroughly and impressively, especially with your massive uh, spreadsheet that you have there of the um, early invaders and prioritising them in your area. Um, we did have a couple of questions and I'm just, I've lost my, um, lost my sheet momentarily. Here it is. Um, so, Someone's made a comment, great evidence-based management shows accountability and allows adaptive management. Hopefully you'll be rewarded with more budgets. So uh, Steve's posted that one. Thanks, Steve. Um, interested to know, um, oh, hang on, we've got another question, a couple of questions that are coming in fast now. Uh, what happens to the species that fall outside of the resourcing in any particular year? Uh, I think that was Stefan that asked that question. Thanks, Stefan. Um, of course, we have a dollar figure that we receive every year in order to treat species. And what we do with our feasibility uh, rankings is we use those to try and start building up that works program. And it allows us to draw a line in the sand where we effectively run out of resources for a year, whether that be time or money or people power. Those species that may not get attention that year, depending on how we use resources, can sometimes and quite often get attention in follow-up years. For us, in most cases, that's looking to figure out how we might then work out how to protect an asset if it's a very large or established infestation. Um, additionally to that, uh, it can also allow us to just manually go in and just keep an eye on how the species is delimiting and how it's spreading, even if we don't have an ability to treat it that year. Uh, one thing to add, actually, sorry, Bianca, is that we do have a couple of species in the landscape that are quite prevalent. And additionally to that, we've been able to actually attract their own funding sources in order to actually treat them. Uh, those in particular in our landscape are pine trees in stringy bark woodlands up north and down south in the landscape we have a quite established issue with Potosmum undulatum, which we've actually been able to receive funding for, and that's alleviated resources in the Eden project to deliver more chicks towards the conversion of the stations. Thanks, Mitch. Um, unfortunately, we haven't got time for any more questions, so if you want to have a look in the chat, there might be a couple in there to uh, answer in your own time, and I'll hand back over to Kate now. Thank you. Thanks, Bianca. Uh, love your work, Mitch. It's uh, been really uh, great watching how you use the tools and thank you for sharing all of that experience today. It's been really, really valuable and I'm sure people have got lots from it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker who is Dan Littlewood. Uh, Dan's with the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning based over in the Hume region in the northeast of Victoria. Uh, it was great to see how the Hume region has been approaching prioritising weeds after fire, and uh, it'll be interesting to learn their method today. And uh, we look forward to supporting Hume region more in the future. Uh, it's a very rugged and remote uh, area of Victoria that they're working in, so added challenges to their weed management program. Uh, Dan's speaking to us today on prioritising weeds in the Hume region after fire. Over to you, Dan. Thanks, Kate. Uh, can you see my presentation okay? I can, thank you. No worries. Okay, so just before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners as well on the lands we meet. So I'm coming to you from Myrtleford, which is uh, Dutaroa country. I'd also like to make a mention of the Aboriginal nations and clans that have a relationship with this part of the world. So Tungarong to the south, Palangang, Midang to the north and Bangarang to the west. They all have connection to this country. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and to any listening today. So my name's uh, Dan Littlewood. I'm a bushfire biodiversity recovery officer in the Hume region for Delp. And today I'm going to talk about how we went about 
prioritising our weeds um, post this summer's bushfire. Just to give a little bit of context, the Hume region is essentially the northeastern part of the state, um, taking in the north and eastern slopes of the Victorian high country. Um, the Murray River bounds our northern boundary and essentially the Goulburn um, floodplains and gold fields to the west. And as many of you are already aware, um, the last summer's bushfires was a significant one up here in Hume. Um, of particular note was the Upper Murray Walworth fire, which burnt from New South Wales through much of um, the Upper Murray district down to Gippsland, and that covered about 200,000 hectares. And the Ovens Abbey Yards fire, which burnt 100,000 hectares to the south of um, uh, Mount Buffalo. And there were other fires across the, dis across the region. Um, there was a number of large fires in the Mitter area and in the Goulburn Fire District. And one of the, I suppose, the challenges that we had in response and, and subsequent reco um, recovery is that the fires burnt in remote uh, mountainous country um, so that, that you pose a real, um, a real a challenge for us in the control effort and recovery. So when we moved into recovery at a local level, some of the first things we do um, is the, the emergency stabilisation works, control line rehab, hazardous tree works, erosion management. But in biodiversity recovery, weed control becomes a priority fairly quickly. And by the very nature of fire and recovery, um, we're often playing a bit of catch up. Um, so it's important to, that we try and prioritise to um, have a timely response before we lose certain opportunities. But also given the, the, the sizable area that we're looking at and, and we sort of lack the data sets potentially of some of the other presenters you've heard, um, we, we need to use a few tools to really prioritise where our efforts um, will go. So how did we prioritise after this summer of bushfires? And, and essentially, um, we started by asking ourselves some pretty broad and simple questions. So for me, I like to break things down and, and make these really nice and easy. So the first is we look at the where, where in where across the landscape or the locations do we need to, to put our efforts in the locations of weed control? What weeds we um, are looking to target in these locations and, and why? So why are we targeting these weeds and these locations? What are we hoping to achieve and how can we make the most of the limited resources and time and and money that we have? So these, these simple questions, I'm going to sort of step through a little bit um, separately, but they all feed into each other and, 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 and always in the, in the back of our minds. So I'll start with the where. So one of the first things we did was we got used this tool that we called the vegetation priority matrix. And this tool was d developed by the Hume Invasive Species Team, so Ian Von Arx, Dave Pastelenik and Cheeseman, following the 2009 fires. And it aimed to help us identify high quality vegetation areas that were at risk of um, weed spread. So the, the parameters that it sort of looks at are the, the boundary of the assessment, so the, the burnt area essentially, the pathway of spread, um, so these are our, our roads and tracks, control lines, our rec sites, um, drainage lines and river areas where, where the weeds will move into new areas, and the impact on the biodiversity, so the vegetation quality. And essentially our analysis looks at the pathways of those spreads, intersecting them over the impact on biodiversity, so that vegetation quality, and, and within the boundary of assessment. And essentially you come up with a bit of a matrix like this. And this, this, this matrix is all built through the ArcGIS program. So this, this table gives us a score and it looks at the ecological vegetation classes as elements. So the status of um, an EVC versus the quality of an EVC in a given area. And you combine the two to give yourselves a priority rating very low to very high and for us to prioritize that we're really very interested in that high very high 
but what does that actually look like? So across the heme region, um, you can you can quickly um, develop a matrix for vegetation priority. And so we're really interested in that that dark blue and and blue areas of the high and very high quality vegetation. And then when you overlay the the burnt area and the pathways of spread, we end up with maps that um, that look something like this. So the the fire area in the grey, and then the orange lines being high um, areas of high quality vegetation, and the red areas um, very high quality. And so these are some of the areas we sort of start our focus at of high quality vegetation areas that are at potentially higher risk of impacts of weeds. The other thing we take into consideration is the fire severity across the across the landscape. So the greater the severity, which are shown in the sort of red and dark oranges in each map, are the the areas that burnt the hardest during the, the summer bushfire. So they're the more heavily disturbed environments. But it's also um, good to highlight where in those fire shapes are pockets of unburnt or low um, low low scorch where weeds could potentially um, take um, see from and, and take advantage of um, the disturbed adjoining areas. So that's a really quick um, a summary of the where, and then we move into the what. So what target weeds um, should we be looking at? And this is sort of starting to tap into either what we've already know about and, and the local knowledge in the area. So some really good tools and, and Mitch made some mentions to them already, but one of the best is the um, the post fire weeds triage manual. And this, this, this sort of really helps you step through some really simple questions um, and, and helps you to prioritize the score, uh, the prioritize the weeds that you go to target. So it's a sort of decision tee that takes you on a bit, a bit of a journey, like a, any good um, reality TV program. So first you sort of start to look at your, your target plant, what the species actually is you're looking at. So getting out there and doing your surveys. Are they new and emerging in particular areas? Assigning a weed group, which is really good, uh, a useful classification of how a certain weed might respond to to fire. So certain uh, weed groups will uh, respond really well, um, but also how they respond in the years, subsequent years afterwards, and um, and it will pr prioritize certain species over others. Uh, the trackability, so um, how much effort is required for the control, the population distribution abundance in a, in a given area or in the landscape. The risks and opportunities. So, what opportunities have arisen post fire environment? Can we access areas that we couldn't access before? And then, to keep in the back of your mind, the non target impact. So, our control methods are, are they going to cause more harm than good? And this then gives us a bit of a score. But, but the main thing that I suppose we had um, issues and and we were battling against was trying to find out those locations and having the, a really good data set um, or um, get the get the understanding of what's actually occurring in the landscape and to do this we sort of had to tap into our resources our our staff and and partners to really understand what's going on in the landscape where were the weeds so we held district um, workshops with staff and partners to really try and understand. Um, what's going on and use these prioritization tools to sort of support a discussion and essentially get staff to nominate um, and develop projects in a given area. Some of the examples of the um, weeds that, that came out of that um, were particularly stuff like blackberry. So um, for the, many of you that know, the human blackberry is a real issue in the Northeast, but so this is a really interesting um, study in how we can find new and emerging populations of blackberry in the upper catchments and trying to get on top of them before they establish. Another species, a couple of species, Cape broom and Scotch broom, so looking at those um, plants, uh, we've done lots of work over the last few decades on broom, so we had a bit of knowledge, but they respond really well to fire, so 
um, getting on top of where they might re-sprout doing surveys, um, but also um, treating areas adjacent to it to, as a seed source. And willow, so in those high quality vegetation areas often associated with um, riparian and drainage lines, ability to get in and access and do some control on the willow that's re-sprouting after fire, um, pose a really good opportunity for us. So we've already started moving into the why, um, to why are we going into these areas and treating these, um, these species, but some of the other considerations that we had when we were nominating various projects was how we could, um, how our actions could support other biodiversity recovery actions. And, as, and a really good example of this was um, the Macquarie perch in the Buffalo River. So an endangered species of fish and one population found in the Buffalo River. And one of the threats to this population after the fire was sedimentation and the reduction of water quality post, um, uh, post the fire. So there was a, there was a real effort to, to get in there, translocate individuals from the population um, and then return them once the water quality improved. So we use this as a really good opportunity to, to sort of control another threatening process that's reducing habitat quality is the willow that's beginning to creep into the upper buffalo. So this enabled us to give greater priority to other, um, greater priority to willow control along the buffalo um, over other projects. So this is, so we found that this might have, um, or this hopefully will have greater um, outcomes for this species, but other biodiversity actions. So we're not working in silo, not spraying weeds for the sake of weeds. And, and finally, um, being able to, to work together with other land management agencies. So one of the things that's really important to consider is that we're not all just working in our own silos. Um, so we maintain our communication with um, other land management agencies such as Parks Victoria, Hancock, so the, the, planta the pine plantations, um, Northeast Catchment Management Authority and Golden Murray Water to name a few. And this enables us to sort of um, support one another, collaborate, pool our resources and get a greater outcome in, in certain areas. So uh, an example of this again in the Buffalo, um, along the Buffalo River, but was um, broom control where we helped support Golden Murray Water on their tenure spray broom whilst we were spraying broom further upstream in our tenure. And, and maintaining conversation with HVP that also were looking at broom control following the fires through their plantations. So that's a really, really brief summary of, of, of how we went about prioritizing post fire, looking at the, the where, the what and the why. But it's been really interesting to hear some of the other, um, other presenters today and, and learn and hopefully we can build on this into the future. So that's me. Thanks, Dan. Fantastic to um, yeah hear your explanation of the um, prioritising prioritisation steps that uh, the Hume region have taken. Um, yeah, post fire. That's great. Um, I think in being conscious of time, we'll ask one question. Um, so can you uh, explain some of the special considerations that you have uh, when you're um, putting together work plans, um, particularly in relation to the steep and rugged country that you're working in over, over that way or up that way? Yeah, sure. There's, there's many um, considerations that we have to plan to uh, plan in, take into account. Some of them being, are we even able to get up there and do the control? So if it's, if it's as simple as weed control, is there water access to do spraying? What sort of actions we need to do? Is it, are they in areas that we can even get to? Do we have to put lines, machine lines in to even get to a site? So there's some of the considerations so then that goes into um, all sorts of, um, you know, environmental, but also protecting cultural heritage if we start going down those sort of lines. So yeah, many and many, many, considerations we have to make. 
Sure, thank you. I'll hand back over to Kate, but if any other questions pop up in the chat, feel free to answer those. Thanks, Dan. That's a fabulous presentation. And something that just strikes me about these three presentations that we've heard from this morning is, is the value of having mapping and spatial skills in your team to do a lot of that grunt work, uh, to especially looking up across bigger landscapes and what a valuable tool that is to have in a team. Thanks, Dan. I'd like to uh, acknowledge one of our collaborators who's also uh, presenting next. Uh, we have a long list of collaborators running this seminar and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Australian Association of Bush Regenerators or Arbor and uh, it's great to have them involved uh, in the webinars and uh, particularly this morning with Dr. Teen McDonald, who's going to presenting uh, next. Um, Teen's focusing on the regeneration of native plants. So it's prioritization, uh, but with a different focus. Uh, but also includes weeds, of course. So it's wonderful to see what Arbor have been doing uh, with supporting community since the fires of last summer in particular. And they've got an amazing assortment of uh, resources available on their website, which I encourage you to have a look at. So Teen this morning is speaking on prioritising for native regeneration with weed control per se, a lesser goal. So over to you, Teen. Thank you. Thanks very much, much, Kate. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm I'm speaking today on behalf of uh, ARBA, the Australian Association of Bush Regenerators, uh, and speaking from our experience as bush regeneration practitioners. Um, so basically, we are an organisation with practitioner members in uh, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. Uh, so we've been working on the ground with wildfire and plant fires for many years, decades in fact. We started the association 34 years ago uh, and uh, fire is something close to our hearts because it's used in our work and we realise and recognise the benefits of wildfire when it occurs for attaining uh, recovery outcomes. Now, uh, the message, main message I want to make this morning is that, that wildfires can make weed problems considerably worse or considerably better. Now, the reason for that is because they tend to flush out uh, buried seed banks of weeds and natives. So this is an, a very important ecological uh, premise here. Now, uh, if we actually take action and reduce the presence of those flushed weed uh, plants before they uh, again flower and set seed and recharge those seed banks, we're making a significant difference to the population because such a large proportion of their seed bank germinates, tends to germinate, particularly after wildfire. And at the same time, natives that store seed in the soil seed bank can germinate. And if we favour those and allow them to uh, uh, thrive without competition from weed, they can then flower and set seed and recharge their seed bank. So we're tipping the balance in favour of improving native resilience and reducing weed resilience. So basically that is the underpinning ecological factor that we take into account. And we see it all the time. Now, post these major wildfires in Eastern Australia, um, there have been wonderful opportunities to undertake work where recalcitrant weeds occur. So it's for this reason. Now, Bitu Bush is very well known uh, to respond to fire with a seed bank flushing uh, response, plus many of the adults die and those that don't re-sprout, but access uh, is improved for treating those weeds. Now, we've known this before the recent wildfires Bundjalung National Park, for example, was the site of extensive aerial spraying 
of Bitu Bush uh, over a decade, uh, about a decade ago, and it resulted in a really transformational management of the coastal dunes and hind dunes. Uh, now, they were aware of this technology because it was developed in the 80s and 90s by Department of Agriculture, uh, John Toth and Paul Millam, uh, for aerially spraying with uh, highly dilute glyphosate in late autumn winter at uh, uh, one litre per hectare uh, at a rate that did not uh, substantially affect native vegetation but did uh, affect the bitu. So, um, and bitu being the only major weed in those most of those situations, it, it was a, an effective ecological approach. But they also were aware because of the work of Paul Weiss on the effect of fire on bitu that there were orders of magnitude uh, greater uh, efficiencies if treatment was um, carried out after fire. And it, it made sense to wait until a wildfire could actually reach the sand dunes and provide the preconditions for a successful program. And that worked. It worked extremely well. In this uh, recent wildfire, there have been similar cases but also there have been cases of scotch broom uh, that were burnt, for example, at Barrington Tops National Park, a 1,000 hectares of scotch broom burnt in the 2019-20 fires out of uh, um, 10,000 hectares of scotch broom. And scotch broom is highly recalcitrant. It's It's got a very long-lived soil seed bank. And so... A fire can be extremely important in flushing that soil seed bank out and you might have about three years to treat that weed prior to it uh, reseeding and recharging the seed bank. So the managers at um, Barrington Tops are uh, working hard to provide uh, attention on ground level um, over the next three years with attracting volunteers to undertake works and they've got an innovative treatment for that as well. So, so the fire for many of these weeds does the primary work through flushing the weed seed banks, and what it, what that does is it enormously reduces the number of years that follow up is required for. The problem with wildfire is that you can't choose the area <laughs> that you you take on. You've more or less you're forced to do what you possibly can uh, within your resources. Whereas with plant burns, even though they're not quite as effective. Um, you at least have the uh, the luxury of uh, choosing the amount of area you take on. So in bush regeneration, our primary goal is definitely to release natives. Um, they are waiting in the soil seed bank, as I mentioned before. This is particularly the case, or probably only the case, in fire-adapted ecosystems or higher disturbance-adapted uh, ecosystems. But what is often... Um, not understood is that there is a coupling of recruitment potential with these natural disturbances due to the uh, adaptation over evolutionary time frames. So what happens is that diversity above ground can reduce over time, uh, but that's not necessarily an indicator that those species are not hiding in the soil seed bank. So, um, yes, lack of fire can be a driver of loss of species over time, but also in degraded areas where we see a lot of weed and loss of native species, we can often mistakenly assume that these sites have lower uh, recovery potential. And we often miss the signs or don't see the signs post a wildfire yeah. in degraded sites uh, because we're not looking closely enough or with enough ecological understanding to know that uh, if there is, if there are signs of native recovery, there's potential for uh, assisted regeneration to occur. In other words, we need to regeneration will occur if we do assist at that point, intervene, and treat the weed at that point. So Arbor has uh, had um, some skin in this game, I guess, and. and what we're saying is that, look, not every weed is necessarily a competitor with natives. This, this depends on, on the ecosystem type. In rainforest, for example, uh, there was uh, 
massive impact of fire on riparian zones in the Kyogle area in the Richmond Valley. And uh, there was a great deal of concern with the amount of weed that was regenerating and very few natives. Uh, we didn't help hugely uh, the Australian Association of Bush Regenerators. This was work mainly carried out by land care. But um, excellent uh, regeneration was uh, appearing of rainforest species and we identified that it wasn't necessary to re remove all weeds because herbaceous weeds weren't necessarily competitors with the rainforest regeneration. What were competitors were these transformer weeds such as cat's claw, Madeira vine and so on. So in terms of priorities, there needed to be rapid attention to the treatment of these transformer weeds in a post-fire situation in those rainforest areas. Uh, here, this is a sclerophyll area in Tulum National Park in northern New South Wales. Um, this was a site affected by bell miner dieback, bell miner associated dieback. So it uh, was in, in, in infested with lantana prior to the fire. The fire killed out the lantana, but what it left were other weeds that were spread by birds in amongst the lantana, an artefact of the lantana, if you like. This one uh, is... Um, Inkweed and inkweed, uh, some people consider a fire ephemeral, but at this density uh, and this amount of cover, it, uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Service uh, deemed it desirable to actually undertake weed treatments now. So once that was treated, and you can see in this photograph uh, the fire lack of the inkweed uh, dying back, um, there are natives occurring in, in, uh, in that area. Uh, now, you know, there's high density of natives and that could be problematic. Um, in fact, National Parks is uh, has another problem on, on their hands when it comes to very high uh, density recovery of woody species. Um, however, you know, it, it, it may have been leaving the inkweed may not have been uh, highly deleterious, but what it means is that after the next fire, we've got increased native resilience and less uh, weed resilience. Moving on to a different ecosystem altogether, this is um, grassland, uh, which is, a, 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 again, an endangered ecological community in the Monero. Uh, this site was highly degraded by, um, prior to the fire, long prior to the fire, by grazing and even some cropping. Now, uh, it was um, dominated by uh, African lovegrass and serrated tussock. Now, these weeds were treated by uh, bush Heritage, um, Australian Bush Heritage, who manages the site, they purchased it uh, in 2006. And uh, this site would perhaps not be considered a high candidate for, for conservation management, except it did have a threatened species in it, uh, button wrinkle wart, wart. So, so terribly important. But you can see in this uh, slide, the black patches are the tussocks of the uh, African lovegrass. So there were natives coming up after the um, area spraying, but uh, it, it was a matter of waiting for the uh, tussocks and the biomass of that love grass to die down. So the, what the fire did, the wildfire that went through this area in January, it cleared those that biomass and it triggered, for one reason or another, the germination of many natives. So it was obvious that... Um, intensive work needed to be done in these sites uh, and not just on African lovegrass because there was a huge range of about 30 weed species, herbaceous weeds that were highly invasive as well. So in our experience, you have to treat these weeds uh, in a comprehensive manner. So this is a photo of um, a workshop that was held, a, 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 a a bush regeneration camp that was held a couple of years ago, uh, weeks ago, I'm sorry, at Scottsdale, and it was the third such workshop, and there have been many other instances of follow-up work after the fire carried out by locals uh, as part of a program uh, supported by ARBA. So we have been having very, very good results uh, here because of the fire. Uh, and so it's a matter of getting in early to... Um, secure the recovery of the natives and to reduce potential for those weeds to flower and set seed and recharge their seed banks. So, so 
in this site that was so highly dominated, 95% dominated by weed, weed grasses, there's now um, increasing cover and dominance of 30 species of forbs and 10 species of grasses. So we're 10 months after the fire, but um, rainfall has only just started in, in late winter, spring. So um, we're still just getting this delayed effect from the uh, post fire rain. So fire is a tool in assisted regeneration. Um, so bush regeneration is just a, a branch of assisted regeneration, I guess. And that's part of the um, a, a range of approaches available to ecological restoration practitioners. So managing competition from weed is very important, but it's only a uh, one tool in the toolbox of assisted regenerators. Others include, for example, in rainforest, providing habitat elements to attract fauna who bring in other biota, but applying disturbances akin to those to which species are adapted is also a highly important uh, treatment involved in assisted regeneration. And so we use fire, you know, fire in sclerophyll ecosystems is, is one of our tools. So the um, fire can be used by practitioners in fire piles. That's very, very common or in surface burns as a pretreatment. Wildfire has been shown to be much more effective. Some man land management bodies actually confine their bush regeneration program uh, to sites that have um, also been burned through their fuel reduction burning program so that uh, it's an integrated fuel reduction and post-fire uh, weeding program, which is uh, really very effective. And this is undertaken in Willoughby Council in Sydney and the Adelaide Hills. So, you know, a lot of people recognise the coupling of fire and regeneration and the importance of ensuring that if you have fire, you must uh, carry out we post-fire weeding. Here are a few examples. Here's a, an example in Wararoon Reserve in Lane Cove in the 1980s. Um, bush regenerators uh, conducted some pile burns in this area that was prior to treatment dominated by small leaf privet, you know. And um, in these sites, if you don't burn, you, you get this mesic shift. You get this shift towards rainforesty type species, which in those sites are less uh, rich. And so we conducted in this burnt area, in this cleared area, as you can see, there's there's no vegetation. We used the weed vegetation as fuel to conduct the burns, and then gradually there was excellent results, and we could compare improved uh, recovery of our target species in the burn pile areas compared to the non-burn pile areas. Uh, and uh, a few years later, and this photo was taken about six years later. Um, you could hardly tell the difference between that site and the adjacent areas that had been managed um, uh, over a period of time. Here's a um, forested wetland situation in a rural site. It was dominated by Ceteria spasolata, really highly dominant, high biomass weed. What you see here is that the weed, which was about 95% cover, has been sprayed prior to burning in order to create a dry fuel that uh, to, to improve the temperature of the fire. The fire um, was fairly intense and resulted in uh, uh, ash cover. Um, immediately after the burn uh, or after rain, uh, we got uh, this flush of ceteria, the seed bank flushed out and uh, not many natives. We protected what we could, but we carpet sprayed that ceteria seedling cover and the next treatment, uh, we had about 50% native cover on the site and only 50% weed cover. Uh, then subsequently, over the years, we were able to consolidate that native advantage and uh, we were able to regenerate about 35 native herbaceous species and seven woody species on the site. So that's it in its... Uh, sort of on a trajectory to recovery where it was on maintenance only. So, you know, success as a result of using fire in a site that was considered to be, you know, beyond redemption, basically. And it's because of what was hidden in the seed bank and the effect of fire and our ability to uh, respond in a timely manner to the uh, uh, weed that was germinating prior to its seeding. Now, 
Um, Arba learned this message big time from the Lane Cove wildfire in 1994, and we learned that communities could turn a wildfire into a plus for nature. Now, um, Arba collaborated with um, uh, Friends of Lane Cove National Park, and we supported the establishment of 18 community bush care groups who worked in trouble spots uh, in the suburbs immediately uh, above the national park. So the national park was surrounded by uh, urban development. So very, very caring uh, residents of the Lane Cove area formed these 18 groups. They were supported by Arbor with some skilled advice for a period of time. And then national parks were able to continue with the coordination of these groups with an employee who was dedicated to that task. And it was outstanding. Um, 20 years later, those sites were uh, st those sites were still under management, and new sites had been added. Um, so after this fire, we tried to get this message out. <laughs> okay, it's a huge fire, and not huge numbers of volunteers to undertake work, but we still wanted to say to people, including the government, look, we know this works. Let's try and mobilise. So Arba did try to form, we tried to advocate as much as we possibly could um, to the federal government uh, and to all other agencies. And we helped to form an environmental NGO network with about 20 groups, uh, uh, with Gary Howling from the Great Eastern Rangers Initiative. And uh, we tried to enlist uh, support of uh, other groups in order to collaborate and help work out what each piece and group was doing in order to avoid duplication and to uh, create synergies in our actions. There was a lot of chaos after that fire. There was not, after those fires, there was not a huge amount of coordination, in fact, very little, and very little funding coming out. So it, uh, that was very helpful. Um, we also realised that um, when COVID hit, uh, the anticipated uh, volunteer coordination that uh, Conservation Volunteers Australia was was commissioned by the government to coordinate, it would not happen. So um, we had to shift towards providing online resources for post-fire uh, work so that at least private property owners uh, could get out on their sites and undertake meaningful work. And we had a fantastic collaboration with Landcare in order to um, support this sort of work. And, and my hat off to all the groups that have been involved. And I have to say, working from the bottom up has been absolutely fantastic. You know, the Landcare facilitators and coordinators have been excellent and um, other groups from LLS and so on, the, the um, regional groups have been very, very helpful. Team, that, uh, uh, that that might be a, a fantastic place to uh, yep. to finish up as we're uh, heading towards our completion time for this webinar. Okay. Uh, let's let's just leave your uh, closing comments there on the screen. Uh, thank, you. thank thank you very much, Teen, for your presentation today. Um, it's uh, it's fantastic what uh, what your group has done, and uh, we really appreciate you being a, a collaborator on this. Uh, webinar series, along with uh, Landcare Victoria, Trust for Nature, uh, some of our other collaborators. So thank you very much. There's a couple of questions for you in the chat, which you're welcome to uh, answer uh, after the webinar has finished. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much, team, uh, for your presentation. Um, and in closing, uh, I just want to thank all our speakers today. Uh, it's been a great uh, series of presentations on prioritisation of weed management after fire. Thank you everyone for logging in, uh, either through Teams or through the YouTube link, um, our support team and uh, all our collaborators. Um, we just want to request that you complete our evaluation form because we're always wanting to improve our, uh, our webinars for the next uh, the next event so the chat is uh, the link is in the chat we'd appreciate you um, completing that the recording for the last webinar is available on the swift website this recording today will be available uh, in the coming days along with the links and information from the chats uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter for early invader weeds and uh, also know that there are two more webinars coming up 
next Wednesday and the following on different uh, aspects of weed management after fire and you can uh, subscribe to those through the SWIFT website. Um, so from B Bianca Gold and myself uh, and our collaborators, we'd like to thank you for joining us today and uh, hope that you've got a lot out of uh, the presentations and we hope to see you next Wednesday. Thank you very much.